back at 5 o'clock today. It is such a blessing that Christmas Eve falls on Sunday, and we have this opportunity to come together this morning and to get together this evening and to really focus on what this, this Christmas thing is all about. And we're going to do that. Uh, this morning, we're going to talk about the Incarnation, and tonight, we're going to talk about we've come to worship. I mean, when the wise men came, they said, we have come to worship him. And that's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to be reminded of how important it is that we make the worship of God incarnate. Come to save people like you and me, the focus of what we're doing this Christmas. If you'll turn in your Bible to John chapter 1, or turn to Genesis 3, I'm sorry. We're focused on John chapter 1, but we'll start with Genesis 3 this morning. Because I'm going to go back to last Sunday. Last Sunday in our Sunday school classes... We were, we were studying Genesis 3, which is the story of the first sin, or as Bible teachers call it, the fall. That was the time when Adam and Eve disobeyed God. They ate the forbidden fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and something changed in their relationship with God. Something changed. God did not change, but something changed in Adam and Eve that altered their relationship with God. If you'll look at verses 7 and 8 in Genesis 3, I'll show you what I'm talking about. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Now, before they ate of that forbidden fruit, they walked with God in the cool of the day. Once they were disobedient, their eyes were open and they became ashamed. Something changed in Adam and Eve. Their sin led them to become aware of their nakedness and they became ashamed. They tried to cover up their shame, but all of their efforts were futile. They were insufficient to bring them any relief from the guilt and shame that they felt. When their best efforts failed... They simply hid themselves from God. Adam and Eve's sin was a game changer. Now, I want to make it clear, God continued to reach out to his people throughout history. I mean, as we read the Old Testament, as we read the Hebrew Bible, you can see how time and time and time again, God sent the prophets to his people to call them, to plead with them, to urge them to turn away from their sin and to turn back to trusting God. In him, God also gave his people a path, a path to have fellowship with him. Each year at the temple, they would bring their sacrifices, sacrifices without spot or blemish, and they would offer them, and God, in turn, would cover over their sins. In addition to these, throughout the Hebrew Bible, we hear whispers from God through his prophets that one day he was going to send a deliverer. He would send a deliverer one day. And they were looking for a deliverer. A deliverer who would overthrow the powers that kept oppressing them. The Assyrians, the Babylonians, and later the Romans. Those who made their lives so miserable and hard. But God had a different kind of deliverer in mind. You know, I share this story with you because I think most of the world today is still looking for a deliverer. Something. Something or someone that can make our life better. Something or someone that will deal with those difficult people in your life and mine that make our lives so hard and miserable at times. Or something or someone who will lift us out of the pit of unhappiness and unrest and transport us to the land of satisfaction and serenity. We're looking for a deliverer. Martin Lloyd-Jones wrote, the terrible, tragic fallacy of the last hundred years has been to think that all of man's troubles are due to his environment. And that to change the man, you have nothing more to do but to change his environment. That is a tragic fallacy. It overlooks the fact that it was in paradise that man fell. The problem that they failed to recognize in biblical times and the problem that we failed to recognize this very day, is that our greatest problem is not them, it is us. Our most pressing problem, my most pressing problem, is me. My problem is deep, 
It is so deeply embedded in me that there is nothing I can do to save myself from this problem of sin. So Paul wrote in Galatians, but when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. When the set time arrived, did you hear that? God sent his son. But how did he send his son and why did he send him? That's what I want us to talk about this morning. At Christmas time, I often hear talk about the baby Jesus, but I want to talk about the incarnation. The word incarnation means the act of becoming flesh. It comes from the Latin version of John chapter 1, verse 14, which in English reads, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Let's read our scripture for this morning, beginning in John chapter 1, verse 1, and going through verse 14. Read along with me. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone (coughs) was coming into the world. He was in the world. And though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh. And made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory. The glory of the one and only son. Who came from the father full of grace and truth. Larry King was a legendary broadcaster. Who they say interviewed somewhere around 45,000 people. In his 60 year career on television. 45,000. He passed away January 23rd, 2021. During his 60-year career, he interviewed every single sitting president. He interviewed celebrities from the world of fashion and entertainment, sports, literature, business, and religion. And when the final episode of his show, Larry King Live, aired on CNN, then-President Barack Obama said this, Larry King, you have opened our eyes to the world beyond our living rooms. Well, in 1990, Larry King was interviewed by People magazine. And during that interview, the interviewer asked him, if you could interview anybody from history, but just one person, who would that person be? And Larry King said, Jesus Christ. Larry King was a Jew. The interviewer said, well, if you could interview Jesus Christ, what would you ask him? Larry King said, I would ask him if he was indeed born of a virgin, because the answer to that question would define history for me. Larry King was right. The answer to that question defines history, not just for Larry King, but for each and every one of us. There are two things that I want us to focus on in the time that we have this morning. First of all, let's focus on the Word was with God from the beginning, and the Word was God. We see this in the opening verse of John's Gospel when he says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. In a world filled with religions of every kind, the doctrine of the Incarnation is unique to Christianity. In some of the world's religions, we find the teaching that God is in everything and everything is in God. That's what we call pantheism, 
Pantheism is made up of two words, the, the, the Greek word pan, which means all, and the word theos, the Greek word theos, which means God. This is what many of the world's religions teach. People who believe in pantheism believe that God is the world around them and God is present in all things. Hinduism and Buddhism teach this very thing. On the other end of the spectrum, as apart from God being in all things and all things being God, on the other end of the spectrum are those religions that teach that God is altogether other. God is so holy, God is so transcendent, so righteous that becoming a sinful human would be the most absurd of all absurdities. Both Judaism and Islam teach this truth about God. And yet there were some Jews who listened to what Jesus had to say, they listened to what he had to teach, they witnessed the things that he did, and they saw him after he had been raised from the dead, and they believed that what Jesus claimed about himself, that it was true. These experiences in life convinced them that what Jesus claimed about himself, that he was God in the flesh, that he was telling the truth. The great Bible teacher J.I. Packer wrote these words, the incarnation, this mysterious miracle at the heart of historic Christianity is central in the New Testament witness. That Jews should ever come to such a belief is amazing. Eight of the nine New Testament writers, like Jesus' original disciples, they were Jews. Drilled in the Jewish axiom that there is only one God and that no human is divine. They all teach, however, that Jesus is God's Messiah, the Spirit-anointed Son of David promised in the Old Testament. They all present Jesus in a threefold role as teacher, sin-bearer, and ruler, prophet, priest, and king. And in other words, they all insist that Jesus the Messiah should be personally worshipped and trusted, which is to say that he is God, no less than he is man. How these Jewish people who were drilled, as J.I. Packer says, in the fact that God is one, God is one, how, were, how did they become convinced that Jesus was God in the flesh? Well, they paid attention. They listened and they watched as Jesus ministered and taught. And let me tell you, that's one of the biggest problems that I find with people today. When we are asked, what do you believe? We'll share our beliefs just like that, having never even considered the evidence. But these folks paid attention. Let me give you just a couple of examples. On one occasion, some of the Jewish religious leaders were harassing and accusing Jesus when they said, Our father is Abraham. And Jesus responded by saying this, Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. You are not yet 50 years old, they said to him, and you have seen Abraham. Very truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, Before Abraham was born, I am. At this, they picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. Why did they pick up stones to try and kill Jesus? Well, they wanted to kill him because when they heard Jesus say, before Abraham was born, I am, they knew exactly what he was saying. Every Jew knew that I am is the divine name of God, Yahweh. The, the covenant name that God gave to Moses and which is found over 6,000 times in the Hebrew Bible, what you call the Old Testament. The name that is so holy that no Jew will even speak that name. Jesus was claiming to be God in the flesh. Before Abraham was born, I am, Jesus said. Let me give you one more example. In John 14, Jesus would soon be arrested and executed on a cross. His disciples had no idea what was coming, even though Jesus had told them time and time and time again. While Jesus was speaking, Philip spoke up. Look at John 14, verses 8 and 9 with me, and let's read them together. Philip said to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. 
Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Isn't that interesting? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Before Abraham was born, I am. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. C.S. Lewis wrote, the Christian story is precisely the story of one grand miracle. The Christian assertion being that what is beyond all space and time, what is uncreated, eternal, came into nature, into human nature, descended into his own universe and rose again, bringing nature up with him. It is precisely one great miracle. And if you take that away, there is nothing specifically Christian left. Athanasius was born in 293 A.D. That was before any of our time, even mine. He was born in Alexandria, Egypt. And there was a controversy in the church during his day, during Athanasius' day, just like there is a controversy in the church in our day. The controversy had to do with the question, what do we do with Jesus? What do we make of Jesus? Was he truly born of a virgin? Was he God incarnate, God in the flesh, as he claimed? <clears throat> or was Jesus simply a created being? The best of humans, but certainly not God. Well, one of the leaders of the group, a man, in, a, a, a man who was a priest in Alexandria named Arius, he believed that Jesus was a created being. And he was very popular among the people, and so he gained an even greater following in this belief that Jesus was not God incarnate, he was a created being. Well, Athanasius knew that the very cornerstone of the faith was in jeopardy. He knew that Arius was denying the biblical teaching of the Trinity and God's plan of salvation. Athanasius knew that the Bible taught that Jesus was born of a virgin, that he lived a sinless life, and he was the only one, the only person in history who could offer his sinless life as a sacrifice for sinful humanity. Athanasius knew that Jesus was fully God, and he was fully man, and yet willing to give his life for the redemption of sinners. This was the truth of the faith, and there was no price that would be too great that Athanasius would be willing to pay, to stand up for that truth. Athanasius was exiled five times by four different Roman emperors. During the 17 of the 45 years that he served as bishop of Alexandria, he served those 17 years in exile. Yet the price that Athanasius paid was no price at all because he kept his mind and his heart focused on the price that Jesus, the God-man, paid so that sinners like Athanasius could be reconciled and made right with God. You know that same controversy is present in our day. That same controversy is raging this very moment. Many believe that Jesus was a great teacher. They'll give you that. He was a humanitarian, unparalleled in history. But when it comes to believing that Jesus was God in the flesh who came to give his sinless life as an offering for sinners like you and me, well, that is something they simply find absurd. As unpopular as that truth may be, my friends, I want to beg you this morning, never ever give in to the pressure of our culture to compromise that truth. Jesus is God who came down to save sinful people like you and me by giving himself as an offering for our reconciliation with the Father. Well, let's move on. So first of all, first of all, we focused on Jesus, the Word, who is equal with the Father, who is eternal as the Word of God, the second person of the Trinity, and fully God. Now I want us to shift our focus on Jesus who became flesh, fully human, and lived among us. Look at John 1.14 with me, just to refresh our memory. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, 
full of grace and truth. I want you to think about something with me just for a moment. <clears throat> if you were God, it's a scary thought, isn't it? But if you were God, and you were going to make yourself known to your creation like never before, how would you do that? How would you make yourself known? I don't have to ask for a raise of hands. I know what kind of entrance we would make because I know human nature far too well. I know exactly what we would do. We would pull out all the stops. We would spare no expense. We would leave an impression that would never be forgotten in all of history. We would summon every lightning bolt that ever flashed across the sky to get everyone's attention. We would command every angel in the heavens, every creature in the sea, on the earth and in the sky to announce our arrival. We would put on a show that they would never forget. And that is what makes God's entrance into our world so mind-boggling. We just finished studying Philippians in my Wednesday Bible study. And in Philippians 2, verses 6 through 11, we find something in Paul's letter to the church in Philippi that most Bible teachers believe he didn't write, that he inherited. It was an early hymn sung by the church. Listen to this beautiful truth. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his advantage. But instead, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Here we find it once again. Jesus is in his very nature God. But instead of selfishly holding on to the glory and the exaltation of being the second person of the Trinity, Jesus made of himself nothing. He became a slave, a servant. <clears throat> he wasn't born to royalty. He was born to a young peasant girl who had never been with a man. His first night wasn't spent in the finest maternity ward in all the hospitals of Jesus. Of, of Israel, but it was spent in a feeding trough for cows and sheep and donkeys. The Prince of Peace was born into a world of war and strife and turmoil. There was a bounty placed on his head from the moment he was born. Herod heard that the Magi was looking for one who was born King of the Jews, and so he called for them. And when they came, Herod told them, whenever you find him, Come back and let me know, because I want to go and worship this new king, too. Well, God revealed to the Magi what Herod's true intentions were, and so they never returned to him. But Matthew tells us what happened in Matthew 2.16. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious. And he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time that he had learned from the Magi, a bounty on a newborn. The God of glory on the run from the moment of his birth. And his life wouldn't get any easier. Back in Philippians 2, we read, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. His entire life was one of humiliation. Oh, he was loved and adored by some, but he was harassed and haunted by the power brokers of his day. He suffered. He wept at the grave of a friend. He was run out of town. He was lied about. He was misunderstood and maligned. He worried about his mother. 
He was tempted in every single way that you and I are tempted, and yet he never, no, not once, did he ever give in to even one of those temptations. The writer of Hebrews tells us, he had to be made like his brothers in every way because he himself suffered when he was tempted. He is able to help those who are being tempted. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. You know, we have so sanitized and sentimentalized that first Christmas morning, haven't we? I want to encourage you this morning to step away from the wrapping paper. I want to encourage you to step away from the tinsel and the beautifully decorated trees. Step away from the beautiful bows and Santa's jolly ho-ho-hos. And be still just for a moment. And hear the cry of that newborn. You see, the newborn king would grow up and he would begin to tell his disciples about his soon coming death and his resurrection. Matthew tells us that Jesus said, we're going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and they will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. And on the third day, he will be raised to life. I heard somebody say just this past week, somebody asked a question rather, what's the best thing that ever happened to you at Christmas? There were all kinds of answers that were given. I listened in, I heard amazing stories that no doubt will never be forgotten by those who experienced them, but let me tell you, if you were a follower of Jesus, the greatest thing that ever happened at Christmas, it was the coming of Jesus and the opening of your eyes and your heart. And if you're here this morning and you are not a follower of Jesus, the greatest thing that could ever happen to you in your life would be this morning for your eyes and your heart to be open and for you to come and receive the gift of the newborn king who died for your sins. And you know, in every religion of the world today, except for Christianity, the followers are commanded to live a good life. To live an extraordinary life. If you will just do better and be good and do more, then you'll catch the deity's attention and find favor with God. That's not what Christianity teaches. You and I as followers of Jesus, we look back to that day when God came to us. He met us in the mess of our life. He wrote himself into your story. Dorothy Sayers was born in Oxford on June the 13th, 1893. Her father was an Anglican priest, and as a kid, Dorothy, who became a famous author, she developed a love for Jesus and a love of literature. She graduated from Oxford in 1915 with first-class honors in modern languages. And during her lifetime, Dorothy Sayers wrote 16 novels, 10 plays, 6 translations, and 24 works of nonfiction. But her most popular series was a series of detective novels about an aristocratic detective named Lord Peter Whimsey. Lord Peter Whimsey was hugely successful. The most famous detective who solved all of the crimes. He was also wealthy and intelligent. He was an expert on all matters of food and men's fashion and classical music. The only problem was Lord Peter Whimsey was never, ever able to make a relationship with a woman work. Women came in and out of his life, and he could never make any of those relationships work. So Peter was lonely. Not only was he lonely, but that loneliness clouded all of the good things that happened in Lord Peter Whimsey's life. Well, about halfway through the Lord Peter Whimsey detective stories, a, peer, uh, a person named Harriet Vane showed up. 
This mysterious woman who graduated from Harvard and wrote detective stories, and she met Lord Peter Whimsey. She was intelligent, and he was drawn to that. She was fun-loving, and he was drawn to that. And the two of them fell in love. And as Lord Peter Whimsey and Harriet Vane fell in love, Peter's life began to be changed like he never even dreamed. And you know, when you step back from the story and you take a closer look at Harriet Vane, Harriet Vane was one of the first women to ever graduate from Oxford. Dorothy Sayers was truly one of the first women to ever graduate from Oxford. Harriet Vane was a writer of mystery novels. And Dorothy Sayer was a writer of mystery stories. You know what Dorothy Sayers did? She looked into the world that she had created for Lord Peter Whimsey, and she saw that he had a need, and there was nothing he could do to meet that need. And so Dorothy wrote herself into the story. She came to help Peter, and she did. But boy, she didn't help Peter in any way even close to the way the Lord has written himself into your story and my story. We were all alone. In a big old world of seven billion people, how can anybody feel alone? How can anybody not be satisfied? And yet, I hear that story every single day. Well, good news. Jesus has written himself into your story. And he's here this very morning. If you're not one of his followers, I want to invite you to come forward. Give me your hand as you give Jesus your heart. If you're already a follower of Jesus, but you're looking for a church home, a place where you can plug in with a group of other believers and, and continue to grow in your relationship with the Lord, we will welcome you with open arms if you'll just come forward and let me know of your desire. Please come as we stand and sing this song of invitation. Please come.